Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the first webinar-style technical presentation by the Royal Institution of Naval Architects, the Institute of Marine Engineering Science and Technology, and Engineers Australia. Engineers Australia acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land waters. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders both past and present and emerging. Our presenter this evening, ladies and gentlemen, is Levi Catton. Levi is Managing Director of Gibbon Cock Australia and a technical advisor to the Hunter Class Frigate Program. He has broad naval program experience as a professional naval architect, engineering manager and program director covering all phases of the naval ship capability life cycle. He joined Gibson Cox Australia as a program director working on the SEA 5000 program in December 2018. Prior to joining Gibson Cox Australia, he held roles in engineering and acquisition management for Irving Shipbuilding on the Canadian Surface Competent Program and roles uh, a production engineering management for ASC Shipbuilding on the Hobart class Air Warfare Destroyer Program and roles with Talos Australia, the Defence Material Organisation and Navy Systems. He obtained his Bachelor's Degree in Naval Architecture with Honours Class 1 from the Australian Maritime College holds a Certificate in Complex Project Procurement Leadership from the University of Ottawa and is currently completing his, his MBA from Deakin University. Ladies and gentlemen, I'll pass you over to Levi Catton. Many thanks, Phil. <laughs> Just let me know uh, if the audio seems okay to you. Uh, thank you for the introduction. Um, it's great to be with you and everyone uh, on the session this evening, at least by the electrons. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining the session. I'm excited to be with you to talk about something that uh, I feel passionate about, uh, and hopefully the technology works for us. Um, first of all, I need to make a bit of a disclaimer. I'll just change slides here. Uh, so the Hunter Class program is a something of national significance. It's got a range of commercial and military sensitivities. So there's things that I can and can't talk about. Uh, this presentation is being provided by me privately on behalf of RENA. Uh, the presentation draws on my personal knowledge of the program through my direct participation and other public domain information that's available that's been released by uh, various participants. So the views expressed tonight are my own. They don't represent the views of the Commonwealth or any of the businesses or organizations or participants in the program. And I've tried to be careful in the facts that I've presented, but I don't warrant the accuracy of any of the information. And of course, any errors or omissions are my own. And I should probably also add a bit of an informal disclaimer as well. I do have young children and they are due home soon. So I can't promise there won't be any uh, interruptions but I probably can promise some random background noise at some point. So apologies in advance for that. Um, and with that understood, I'll move on to what I'm going to attempt to cover in the session. Uh, so this is more or less what the Hunter Class Frigate is going to look like. Uh, and I know a number of the images I've used in these slides are released by BAE Systems or ASC Shipbuilding. So I acknowledge my use of their images in these slides. Uh, I've tried to keep the presentation fairly general and I'm going to cover a, a range of topics. So hopefully there'll be something of interest for everyone in a wide audience. Uh, the presentation's in two main parts. I've spent a bit of time talking about the programmatics and then the second part I'll uh, touch on some of the capabilities of the Hunter Class Frigate. So just a quick summary. Firstly, I'll address the role of Gibbs and Cox in the project, which is probably a bit of a shameless plug really, but it's probably useful for context. Uh, then I'll provide a bit of background on the Anzac Frigate, which the Hunter class is replacing. I'll review some of the high-level considerations that the government made in uh, establishing the project and uh, the broad, sorry, I've got to fly, the broad acquisition strategy uh, that they've applied and their objectives. Uh, and I'll also touch on some of the considerations around sovereign capability and the government's goals with relation to Australia's future naval sector. I'll touch on the overall schedule at a very, very high level and note some of the key participants on the project. 
And then I'll move on to more mission system related things more specifically, and I'll outline some of the key changes being made to the reference design, describe some of the main characteristics and elements of the combat system and the platform system. And uh, just a couple of comments on the shipyard. So I was, in I was intending to try and pack all of that into about 45 minutes. I don't know how realistic that is, but hopefully they will keep us busy. Uh, and I just note that uh, questions can be submitted in the Q&A bar in the uh, WebEx session. And I think Phil is going to bring some of those questions forward at the end of the uh, presentation for discussion. Okay, uh, so my next slide here. Uh, just firstly, a little bit about Gibbs and Cox. Uh, Gibbs and Cox has had a central role in the design and engineering of pretty much every surface combatant that served in the US Navy since about the 1930s. And on the basis of that very extensive and continuous experience, we've developed mature world leading capabilities across the naval engineering life cycle. So we consider ourselves the world's preeminent independent naval design organization. And as such, we're able to engage uh, with a mixture of government side and contractor side work. And this really allows us to participate in a way which provides the most uh, impactful participation on each of the programs that we're involved with. Uh, in Australia, uh, Gibbs and Cox has enjoyed over 50 years of partnership with the REN. I think actually, I did some, I checked on this this afternoon. I think it's going to be 60 years this year since. Um, discussions on Perth class began. Uh, we've supported each of Australia's surface combatant programs since then in one role or another, either as designer, design agent, change design agent, or in various technical advisory roles. And we're continuing that partnership today with government side support to Australia's current three major naval shipbuilding programs, the attack class submarine, the Arafura class OPV, and the Hunter class frigate. And of course, we're looking forward to continuing to support the realization of government's objectives for the naval sector. And lastly, is the shameless plug part. Um, if you know a senior to principal level mechanical or electrical engineer, we're hiring. Um, so keep an eye out. Um, just a little on the background, uh, ANZAC is the precursor to the Hunter class. Um, and as Australia's most recent frigate experience, it's fundamentally this experience that the Hunter class requirements and program have arisen from. And ANZAC's really the mainstay of Australia's current surface combatant fleet. There's eight hulls commissioned between 96 and 2006. Uh, it's a light frigate based on a German design, the Miko 200. It's generally considered to have been quite a successful and cost-effective asset in the REN fleet. Uh, and it's previously gone through the Warfighting Improvement Program, which incorporated the first generation Australian CFAR radar. And more recently, uh, the fleet's undergoing a further major upgrade under the ANZAC Midlife Capability Assurance Program. Uh, and I think this is a picture of a runter in Henderson during the AMCAP work. Uh, AMCAPing involves the incorporation of CFAR 2. Uh, which is important for the HANA program, as well as comms upgrades and a platform remediation program. All the ANZAC holes will receive AMCAP upgrades to maintain a regionally competitive fleet. And ANZACs are expected to be in service until sometime in the 2040s, which is about 60 years since the design was first done, so a long lifespan there. And I also wanted to note Navy's experience, uh, increasingly uh, deep and positive experience with CFAR on the ANZAC class was quite significant in government's decision to mandate this system in the Hunter class program. And the next generation of CFAR is going to bring some very sophisticated capabilities to our surface fleet. Uh, so I'll just talk a bit of a bit of background that some of the considerations that the government made that led to the formation of the Hummer class program as we now know it today. So the 2009 defense white paper that was under the Rudd government foreshadowed the eventual replacement of the ANZAC class with a larger ASW focused frigate. In the early 2010, there was growing concern about the loss of manufacturing industry capability in Australia, particularly in relation to the automotive industry in South Australia. 
It was also becoming clearer that shipbuilding jobs would drop significantly following completion of the three-hull Hobart-class build, the so-called Valley of Death, and there was significant pressure applied by the shipbuilding labour force uh, seeking improved job security. And these factors caused the government to consider offsetting these issues by ramping up follow-on shipbuilding work earlier than planned, and the 2013 white paper suggested that the future frigate project could be brought forward as a contributor to this. Uh, and the Hobart class experience. Although Hobart class began with a modified off-the-shelf approach, there was a range of complexities, uh, increasing level of change, there was some difficulties with production data, uh, complex construction program over a range of yards, um, a lack of overall national shipbuilding experience. All these things contributed to some fairly serious cost and schedule overruns. And that experience had an impact on government's thinking on how to structure future shipbuilding programs and led to a renewed focus by government to contain risk in the future frigate project. Uh, the government did make an effort to potentially fast track the commencement of post Hobart class shipbuilding work. They uh, commissioned a engineering study to determine if the Hobart class design could be suitable as a reference design for the future frigate but ultimately they concluded that they would run a competitive evaluation process. The government also commissioned a study by RAND in the US to investigate the sustainability of a long-term continu continuous naval shipbuilding program. And that study concluded that it was possible, but would require fairly careful phasing activities, significant investment, and major productivity improvements to achieve reasonable cost effectiveness. Uh, and I think I neglected to list on the slide, but the 2016 white paper increased the number of future frigate hulls from eight to nine. Uh, and then lastly, the uh, 2017 National Naval Shipbuilding Plan set out uh, in fulsome form government's objectives for the naval sector, addressing the issue of sovereignty uh, in Australia's naval capabilities, establishing as policy the concept of continuous naval shipbuilding and setting out a viable plan to achieve it. So then in 2018, BAE Systems was selected as the head contract for the Hunter class design and construction contract. Uh, as part of the contracting arrangements, ASC Shipbuilding, uh, which was previously a government business enterprise, uh, was sold to BAE Systems and ASC Shipbuilding was then awarded the head contract for Hunter class. Under this arrangement, BAE Systems and ASC Shipbuilding undertook a range of obligations in relation to developing Australia's sovereign capability to be able to develop and field surface combatants. And the, the 2018 quote uh, there on the slide from Minister Payne sets out the objective that ASC Shipbuilding will eventually become Australia's, effectively Australia's national asset for developing and delivering naval surface ship capability. So this slide shows the defence budget positions of naval designing nations compared with Australia. Australia's in the middle of the balloon there. Um, and I want this to indicate that a number of nations do support successful and exporting sovereign design capabilities, uh, while under def defence budget that's equal to or even lower, sometimes significantly lower than Australia's. Um, and so there's a, there's a justification there to show that it is, in fact, possible to run a successful uh, exporting design program on the kinds of defence budget that we uh, are currently running. There's really quite a broad spectrum of, of opinion as to whether naval design is a suitable objective for Australia. Uh, one of the primary concerns is the level of risks associated with the design activity. Uh, and that really has two responses. Firstly, the areas where risk arises are well understood and controlling those risks is really a question of priorities, not of capabilities. And secondly, we need to look at uh, that, the risk of running a design program, but we also need to look at the risk of not having proper sovereign capabilities in relation to our national security. Um, and we've gotten a little taste of the implications of that kind of thing um, with the recent COVID-19 epidemic. 
uh, and perhaps this will have an impact on our long-term considerations about supply chain sovereignty, sovereignty in our uh, military capabilities. Uh, so the ultimately the reason that we would be seeking to establish a design capability is because the supply chain follows the design. So designers tend to specify materials, parts and equipment that are familiar or local or convenient to them. And that tends to be from within their national supply chain. So a local design capability results in two things. First of all, local industry content into the program and resulting economic benefits. And secondly, better sovereign control of the supply chain that supports the military capability. Uh, the main objection to sovereign design is associated with the risk and cost and schedule efficiency benefits of using existing designs. And this is often assumed, but the data on this is actually quite inconclusive and there's no clear correlation between design provenance and cost and schedule outcomes. And Hobart class is a classic uh, example of that. Uh, so overall, the government's strategic objectives represent uh, a range of interesting opportunities and challenges for Australia's naval sector, and we'll, of course, need to meet those opportunities and challenges uh, inventively. So noting the uh, historical and strategic context, the government has some specific strategic interests in the Hunter class program, uh, and they've clearly driven the overall acquisition strategy. So these interests include incorporation of key systems, uh, particularly combat systems, to which Australia has already made uh, a significant commitment, uh, developing our sovereign shipbuilding capability, early commencement of production work to minimise impact on industry capability and jobs, uh, controlling the risk in the program to protect cost and schedule, and contractor accountability for project success. And the Hunnic program represents probably the major portion of the investment under which the long-term goal of a sovereign, sustainable surface combatant development ability is intended to be developed. So to this end, the government required ASC to commit to a significant technology transfer program, provision of IP rights, uh, development of engineering, programmatic and production expertise throughout the program. And in order to make the head contractor fully accountable for successful project delivery, uh, I talked about the ownership of ASC shipbuilding being transferred to BAE Systems. And the government's retained a sovereign share in ASC shipbuilding. So this brings the engineering and programmatic and production activities together under one commercial structure. And that's important to be able to um, allow that uh, commercial entity to achieve optimal cost and schedule performance. So this approach overall maximizes the head contractor accountability for the delivery and pro program success. Uh, it utilizes the existing shipbuilding skills and experience that were resident within ASC shipbuilding, and it improves the work stability for the existing labor force. So that's kind of some of the strategic uh, drivers of the acquisition strategy and, and the contracting approach. So these are the official objectives of the Hunter class program. These were set out in the RFT. First of all, we have to deliver nine ships, anti-submarine warfare frigates. Uh, and it says uh, MOTS design or uh, uh, military off the shelf and minimum change. So minimum change is a bit of a tricky subject because there was also uh, a bunch of major changes that were mandated, which I'll talk about in a bit. So minimum change is a bit of a subjective idea, uh, noting that the combat system is almost completely developmental, but it is a guiding principle. Uh, the next objective was contribute to a continuous naval shipbuilding industry in Australia, which I've talked about. Um, the next objective is maximizing Australian industry capability. Again, a little bit subjective, but there's a range of processes being applied to uh, progress and manage this. Commencement of construction in Adelaide in 2020. Uh, and I'll talk a bit more about the prototyping program. Uh, establish affordable commercial arrangements, talking about cost, the spend profile, the risk share, and lastly, achieving overall value for money. 
And addressing value for money, we, we have to consider things like the long-term strategic obligations uh, of the contractor in terms of IP rights, what they're bringing in terms of technology transfer, development of a design capability, as well as just the direct uh, immediate cost performance uh, in designing and producing the chips. So a key aspect of the government's mandate for the project is an aggressive schedule. And this is really a um, uh, very, uh, this affects the program in a lot of different and, and interesting ways. So the, the schedule is really driven by the need to begin production work as quickly as possible to re-establish jobs in the manufacturing sector, sector and minimizing the loss of capability uh, and skills in that workforce following completion of Hobart class. So to achieve the government mandated production start of 2020 and still provide adequate time for the design and productionization scope uh, to actually uh, make the design changes that are necessary, uh, there was an extended prototyping activity formulated and that will commence from late this year. Uh, and that's gonna comprise five blocks, which are sections of the ship, uh, roughly the, I guess for argument's sake, about the size of a house or a two story house. Uh, and those blocks are based on production data from the UK's Type 26 production program. Uh, and and uh, they're in the process of uh, managing the transfer of that data currently. So that's the prototyping program that will run for two years. And then the production of ship one will start around late 2022. Um, the prototyping program is intended to uh, integrate and set to work the uh, software and data ecology. Uh, it'll establish and mature the process of the various shipyard departments, activate the supply chain, uh, and demonstrate the operating readiness of the facilities and equipment, and just mature the overall shipbuilding capability uh, of the new organization, uh, substantially new facility, and probably uh, a range of um, new people on the shipyard. And so it's intended to bring all those together into a going concern so that uh, they can hit the ground running at the start of ship one production. Uh, just a very high level schedule graphic. Um, this sets out the, uh, the overall timeline. I, um, it's an aggressive schedule. I previously worked in, in Canada on the Canadian Surface Combatant Program. And when the Australian program milestones were released, all of the Canadian teams were pretty much universally convinced that they were unachievable. And so uh, I, I really think the government and Navy and CASG and BAE and ASC uh, have done a fantastic job in not, not only setting but maintaining uh, a program which meets the necessary objectives, not just what people consider to be reasonably achievable by industry norms. So we're really leading the world in terms of the uh, pace of implementation of the program. And that's exciting. Uh, so now I'm going to touch on some uh, key technical changes. So MOTS design or a reference program, a reference design program, sorry. So we're using the Type 26, UK's Type 26 design as the reference design, also known as the global combat ship. Uh, and that design is currently being built uh, for the Royal Navy in Glasgow. And it's also been selected for Canada's uh, surface combatant as well. Uh, so three different programs using the same base design. Uh, and in order to get the expected benefits from a reference design approach, uh, one of the key issues is controlling the amount of change. Uh, so at a certain fairly hard to define point, the reference design stops being useful if you change it too much. And at a point somewhere beyond that, it actually becomes more difficult uh, and expensive to have started from a reference design. So controlling change is really important to uh, the success of the acquisition strategy. Hunter class is a bit of a mixed bag. Uh, the government did understand and did direct the minimum change imperatives. Uh, but there's also some compelling strategic reasons for government to mandate certain uh, changes, particularly particular combat system and uh, equipment and software. And that's led to uh, 
a fairly challenging development and integration load on the combat system design. Uh, and then on the platform system side, things are relatively more stable, but with a handful of necessary change areas to adapt to different combat systems, uh, different aircraft, different weapons and comms uh, systems, etc. So this slide illustrates uh, the areas of change that were agreed by government. Uh, the first is alignment with the US Navy's Aegis Combat Management System as Australia's primary CMS. Uh, we're integrating Aegis Baseline 9 to Hunter. Uh, the next is CEA Technologies CFAR radar system. Uh, this has had significant Commonwealth development through the ANZAC class upgrade programs. It's widely considered to be world leading technology in terms of the capability that it offers for the weight, size, power, and cost profile. Uh, the next is the US Navy's MH60 Romeo uh, aircraft ASW system. That's now RAN fleet inventory, uh, and therefore it needs to be supported by the Hunter class. And there's, of course, a set of physical and functional integrations that need to be performed to uh, achieve that support. Uh, the next is weapons. Australia owns a set of anti-air weapons, notably SM2 and ESSM. They're associated with the Aegis ships. And collectively, that inventory is a very expensive asset owned by the Commonwealth, so we don't particularly want to have to sell a whole bunch and then buy a large new inventory of different missiles. So Hunter class deletes the Type 26's Sea Scepter missile system and expands the Mark 41 VLS capacity uh, to support those weapons. Uh, next is the comms suite. The RAN's operational comms plans are based on a specific set of comms capabilities, and these need to be uh, provided uh, to support operation in accordance with the RAN approach. And lastly, we have to apply with relevant Australian legislation. And there's a couple of curly ones in there, most notably the WHS Act 2011 um, and a few other things. So they're the main heads under which changes are occurring. Uh, I'll talk a little bit more about the capabilities in a little bit. Um, first, I'm just going to talk about uh, participation on the project or who's doing what to who. Uh, the full stakeholder map is quite complex. So this slide is just a curated list of participants. Uh, I've just put it in alphabetical order and I'll just mention a few of the key ones. Obviously, ASC shipbuilding is the biggest in terms of expenditure and significance and overall control and impact to program success. They are the head contractor. They hold overall, uh, overall responsibility for delivering the mission system and the support system to the Commonwealth. They have subcontracted BAE Naval ships in the UK to provide the design IP for Type 26, as well as a big chunk of the engineering design services for Hunter class changes. And they will build the ships at the Osborne shipyard in Adelaide. Uh, within CASG, uh, the main particip participating branches are the Ship Acquisition Surface Combatants branch, essentially the project team, pardon me, the Combat Management and Payload Systems branch, uh, which is responsible for acquiring the government furnished elements of the combat system, such as Aegis and CFAR, and also providing combat systems assurance, and also Naval Construction branch, which is responsible for providing build assurance. Uh, CEA Technologies is developing and delivering the CFAR 2 radar system. There's a number of above the line contractors supporting the Commonwealth team, of which Gibbs and Cox is one. Uh, Lockheed Martin Australia and Saab Australia are providing uh, key combat system development and integration services to ASC shipbuilding. And also uh, LMUS is providing the Aegis system via a US Navy foreign military sales case. Uh, the shipyard was designed by, or the shipyard upgrade, I should say, was designed by Odense Maritime Technologies out of Denmark, and it's being uh, constructed and delivered by Lendlease under contract to Australian Naval Infrastructure, which is the uh, government business enterprise uh, which holds uh, Australia's various uh, shipyards and shipyard facilities. Obviously, the Navy managed the requirements. Uh, they fulfill a range of engineering and certification assurance roles, and they have, I think, probably the hardest job in the program, which is to get money from the government. Um, there are a heap of organisations supporting the program. 
and although it's commercially and technically quite complex, broadly my observation is that organisations are working together effectively to achieve collective uh, success, and that's uh, great to watch in action uh, and great to be a part of. So that uh, concludes with that slide. That concludes the programmatic part of what I wanted to cover. I'm going to change gears a little bit, and I'll just give a quick review of the capability that's being uh, offered by the Katana class, just touch on some of the key systems. Uh, so firstly, dealing with the uh, combat system. The combat management system is fundamentally Aegis, but it has a layer called the Australian interface uh, over the top of it or down the side of it, depending on which way you want to think about it. Uh, and that interface does two things. First of all, it transcribes the Aegis outputs into a format that's aligned with the way RAN fights engagement in terms of the, uh, the user interface, the doctrine and processes. And secondly, it integrates the other combat system elements on the ship, which uh, won't be interfaced to Aegis. Uh, so in terms of the key warfare sensors, uh, HANA carries the next development of the C-52 radar. Uh, it has electro-optical and infrared sensors for the underwater suite, a bow sonar array, and a towed array sonar system with both a longline passive array and an active towed body as well as a range of electronic warfare systems. And the decoy effectors include uh, the Australian US design NOLCA active RF system, as well as the more traditional chaff and flare launches. And then, sorry, just a flight. Um, in terms of the uh, weapons, uh, it's a pretty comprehensive onboard weapon suite. It's actually a pretty dangerous ship. Um, and, uh, that allows commanders to make appropriate response choices uh, in engagements and, and live fire situations. So uh, a well-equipped ship from a combat systems perspective um, using the world's um, most capable available systems. Um, the thing that really makes it dangerous though is this aircraft. Um, this is really the most versatile and lethal asset on board Hunter class ships. It's the MH60 Romeo. Uh, as well as an advanced anti-surface and anti-submarine sensor suite uh, and the Mark 54 lightweight torpedo, which is the primary anti-submarine weapon. Uh, Romeo is now also integrated Hellfire and ATKWS rounds, and this enables the aircraft to perform quite a broad range of missions over and above the primary ASW role. Um, and the Romeo system has uh, some quite advanced features. It has a dedicated high bandwidth data link uh, back to the ship, which enables uh, detailed sensor and track data generated by the aircraft to be integrated with the ship's underwater warfare suite. Uh, and this makes the ship aircraft combination a very coordinated and, and very effective fighting unit. And that's gonna give the Navy uh, a very significant anti-submarine capability. Uh, just moving on to the, the platform systems, I'll just touch on a few of the uh, kind of key aspects of the platform system. Uh, so the, the platform system design backs up the underwater sensor suite with some uh, world-leading acoustic performance. This has been a real focus of the Type 26 design team in the UK um, and probably the imperative design driver in the platform design. So what a very quiet ship enables you to do is hear a lot better uh, because your own ship acoustic sensors are able to hear more of what's going on nearby in the ocean instead of just listening to your own engines and propellers. Uh, and so this improved sensor performance really translate into higher probabilities of successful engagements. Uh, the platform's designed with a high level of shock resistance to enable the ship to keep fighting after an attack. It's a welded steel construction. Um, standard shipbuilding grade steel for the most part. And uh, the mast structure is going to be aluminium. Uh, and it's designed to and will be built under survey to Lloyd's Register naval ship rules. Uh, it's a heavy frigate. It's big. It's about 9,000 tonnes. Uh, that makes it about two and a half times bigger than the ANZAC class it's replacing. So a bit of a leap in real estate on board the ship. Um, and it's also about 40% bigger than the Hobart class destroyers. 
Uh, so very big, very capable ship. Um, the propulsion system is uh, a diesel, electric, or gas turbine arrangement. Uh, the lower and uh, quiet patrol speeds are run on diesel electric drive. And then the top end speeds on the MT30, obviously you get a significant uh, noise increase once you go through, uh, once, you, once you bring on the, the turbine. Uh, the top speed's moderate for a frigate, but the need for really high top speeds is starting to become a little less relevant these days for surface ships. Um, the sensor and weapon and countermeasure performance is now really dominating the engagement models. So, uh, so this is my um, this is my favourite feature of the design. Uh, this is the mission bay. Uh, it's a full width compartment across the main deck, and that's used to store and deploy boats and other systems. Uh, it can stow four large boats or a number of 20-foot ISO containers for uh, a whole host of purposes, delivery of emergency or military supplies, or you can also use containerized mission packages and plug them into the ship um, for special mission support, uh, UAV deployment, a whole range of things. Really, the um, your only limit is your imagination there in terms of the kind of missions that you want to support, but there's a, quite a bit of real estate there. With um, It's also plumbed for services in terms of power and cooling water and so forth. Uh, this is another view of the mission bay. This is the Davit deploying a ship's boat uh, over the side of the ship. The Davit rotates to service both sides of the ship and see some pretty powerful looking Davit there. Uh, and then I think I've got one more picture, yeah. Um, so it's also uh, openable to the hangar on the aft bulkhead of the mission bay. So you can actually roll aircraft through the hangar and into the mission bay. And this is uh, pretty handy because it allows you to transit up to two additional aircraft in storage while operating a third. Uh, I really like this feature of the ship because I think the whole arrangement is superbly practical. And also I've seen uh, evidence that this arrangement was actually developed in Australia in support of RAN concept studies uh, before it was picked up by the UK mod during Type 26 concept studies. So it's nice to see it come full circle back to the RAN. Um, okay, I think this is the last point I'm gonna to touch on uh, with regard to the platform characteristics. This was the flight deck. So. Huge flight deck, and uh, the reason is it's been sized and rated for Chinook. Uh, Chinook's operated by uh, both the UK and Australia. Uh, and when you consider, along with the capabilities of the mission bay and the flexibility that that offers, we can really conclude that the Hunter class is going to be a very flexible platform and support quite a broad range of missions compared with the, um, compared with the ANZAC that it's replacing. Um, I'll just touch quickly on the shipyard. This is an image of the uh, Osborne South shipyard. Uh, it's been transferred from ASC shipbuilding ownership to the ownership of a separate Commonwealth entity, Australian Naval Infrastructure. Um, they are holding national shipbuilding infrastructure assets and then leasing them back to uh, projects or shipbuilding businesses. So in this case, pardon me, ASC shipbuilding in the case of the Hunter class program. So the three large buildings that you see in the foreground are the new portion of the yard. And then the part on the upper right is the existing yard. That's the yard that the Hobart class DDGs were constructed in. Uh, and then on the upper left, you can see the submarine yard in the background. So these are uh, just starting to come online now. This is a photo of the yard as it is just recently. This is the a and I uh, photo. Um, we're pretty close now to handing over the initial tranche of buildings to support commencement of things like um, equipment commissioning uh, and prototyping will be commencing later this year. So that pretty much concludes uh, the points that I had planned to cover. Um, and Phil, maybe I'll hand back to you at this point for any questions. I hope uh, there was something in there that was of interest to, to the group and thanks to everyone for um, tuning in.
Phil, back to you. In which they were actually presented. The first one is from Chris Skinner, which says, this collaboration by Rhino and IMR ESC with Engineers Australia, is this a frequent arrangement or was it a one-off for this event? Well, probably I can answer that one, Levi. Um, we, Rhino and IMR ESC, uh, have actually signed up with um, uh, Engineers Australia, oops, sorry, uh, signed up with Engineers Australia for this presentation plus two succeeding ones in both June and July. So it's um, an ongoing arrangement for at least the next two months following this one, Chris. Uh, the next question was from... Uh, I can find it, Mark Hopkins at, um, I can find it. Uh, hi, Levi. Are there key differences between the HCFP versus AWD in terms of program management, co contracting and construction management generally? Yeah, great question. Um, yes, there are significant differences. Um, and in fact, uh, the, the government's AWD experience uh, informed some of those differences. Those differences were very deliberate. Uh, so where uh, AWD used an alliance structure, which I think the government found probably tended to blur responsibilities a little bit, uh, they set quite a deliberate strategy following that to uh, use a single point of accountability and that a head contractor would be responsible for uh, the entire delivery of the ship. So in terms of the contracting structure, the AWD experience did result in significant changes to the way that Hunter class, um, in the way that Hunter class is being uh, contracted. Uh, in terms of the uh, the broad approach to government furnished materials, that's not especially different because by and large you have to buy US systems through FMS cases and the government has to do that. Um, I'm just trying to remember uh, the other aspects of the question, Phil. I think maybe that might have answered the bulk of it. Okay, thanks, Levi. Uh, the next one's from Anthony Duncan, and he says, are you able to expand upon how you are controlling program risk? What tools are being used for tracking and report to for tracking and reporting risk to the stakeholders? Yeah, great question. Um, so just at a really high level, there's um, two risk libraries, um, being essentially the Commonwealth's risk library and the head contractor's risk library. Uh, the Commonwealth is using um, two, a two-tiered risk library uh, with a, uh, I guess, a strategic uh, set of classified risks, and then there's a lower-level operational set of unclassified risks, uh, and that spans the full spectrum of programmatic, operational, capability risks uh, within those libraries. Um, and then on the ASC side, they have uh, a risk library which they share with us and the, um, that deals, again, with a broad range of risks, programmatic, uh, operational in terms of the shipbuilding and integration operations. Um, and those, the ASC risks inform the Commonwealth risks. Um, so that's, that's kind of the broad structure that's being used. Okay, thanks, Levi. The next one's from Mitesh Kumar, and he says, do the UK Type 26 ships have different combat systems from IGAS? Yes, they do. They use uh, the UK RNs, I think it's called CMS-1, which, uh, yeah, it's a quite a different product. Okay. Uh, different, different, uh, different missile set. The Type 26 is using a combination of C-Scepter and Mark 41 uh, VLSs. Um, the C-Scepter uses the common, oh, what's it called, common airframe modular missile, I think, um, for the shorter range. As, uh, we're using um, ESSM for the shorter range and then um, both SM2 for the longer range. The gun is the same. Um, 
I'm trying to think what the other differences are. There's there's a range of oh, and of course the radar is um, very different. Uh, our radar is going to be uh, far and away more capable than the um, Type 26 radar. Uh, the Hunter class is going to be a more balanced, even though it's it's designed as an anti-submarine warfare frigate. It's going to be a more balanced frigate, um, whereas the uh, the UK frigate is much more ASW focused and its air air warfare capability will be significantly less than um, Hunter class. Okay, thanks, Levi. Next one's from Anthony Duncan. He says, uh, key changes. Has there been any consideration given to operational environment which impact platform systems, uh, heating, cooling, auxiliary systems, et cetera? Yes. Plenty of consideration, but no actual changes to the mission system. Um, it's a, it's a, the, the difficulty is if you design to a different set of baseline requirements, you potentially have to do a lot of platform system change. And um, in terms of cost and schedule risk, that was didn't didn't make it over the line. Right. Okay. Um, Jonathan Sibley says DSWMS is a major change and very confusing. Uh, what was the acronym? Sorry. Uh, DSWMS. DSWMS. I don't know the acronym off the top of my head. I'm not quite sure what's being referred to. No, that's a new one on me as well. Uh, Alfred Stolter said. Stolfa says, exactly how do you see the WHS Act impacting on the design activity? I have some exposure on aerial platform introduction into service. Yeah, great question. And I'm, I'm probably not close enough to that issue to answer this question with any, um, <coughs> uh, with any uh, proper intelligence. But um, the, the UK, the UK uh, WHS um, Act uses a uh, slightly different test. Um, uh, based on the, what the Australian legislation used to be based on, which is as low as reasonably practical, which fundamentally meant that you could make a choice about how much risk you were willing to, uh, how much residual risk you were willing to tolerate. So you you could have uh, you could have an executive authority say. I'm satisfied that I've made reasonable efforts to mitigate this risk and I'd prefer not to spend any more money mitigating it further. And they were allowed to make that judgment under the under the previous Australian legislation. And that's the current that's the extant uh, approach in the UK legislation. So that informs the way that their safety case is built. Because the 2011 WHS Act here has changed the test in terms of uh, how a risk has to be uh, mitigated to so far as reasonably practical, which is generally interpreted to mean, I think, that you have to, um, you have to uh, go further in mitigating the risk. Or if there's a risk existent, you are compelled to address it without making a judgment that it's no longer practical to do so. Um, so I'm kind of at the edges of my safety legislation knowledge here. <laughs> Um, but in any case, there's a material difference between the tests that are applied in the legislation, and because the uh, safety, the UK safety case is based on the UK legislation approach, there are, there is a fair bit of thought that has to go into how that safety case has to be adapted to uh, fulfil Australian legislative requirements. Okay. Someone more informed on me than me on safety legislation could answer that question better. But that's my that's my appreciation from a Hummer class perspective. Okay, thanks, Levi. The next one's from George Curtis, and he says, "How is it an MOTS design since there is no ship Type 26 already built in the UK?" Yeah, well, it's a MOTS design, but it's not a MOTS ship. Okay. The same objection which has been raised by many people um, on Australian and Canadian programs along the way. I don't disagree. It's not a wrong comment. It isn't proven in the sense that, you know, a ship that's been operating at sea is proven. Uh, and that represents a level of risk, which um, 
there's been a fair bit of thought applied to what that risk profile looks like and how it's mitigated. Um, so yeah, a MOTS design, not not an operating MOTS ship. Okay, thanks. Trevor Linda asks, uh, do you have any thoughts on sustainment alignment with Plan Galileo? Uh, great question. Lots of work going on on that on the project. Not something that I personally can speak to. I'm just not close enough to the ILS space. I can go so far as to assure uh, people that um, the program is uh, very cognizant of the uh, of Plan Galileo and what it's attempting to do and seeking to align the support system requirements and so forth with those objectives. Okay, thanks. Trevor also asks, what can you say about the digital shipyard concept with respect to supply chain and um, AIC, I think it is? Yeah, okay, with respect to supply chain and AIC. Um, yeah, that's quite an interesting question. Um, there's, I guess, a variety of aspects to that. So the digital... Yeah, there's a few different things going on. So in terms of supply chain, so the digital shipyard's complex and it, and it supports um, a variety of different aspects. First of all, it's, um, it supports the interface between engineering and production. Uh, in terms of supply chain, it leans out the uh, purchasing activities. So the, um, there's a higher level of Probably not automation might not be the long wrong word, but there's a there's a higher level of integration between the um, the bomb definition in the engineering program and the uh, the purchasing activities that the supply chain department uh, runs. So I, I guess if you boil it right down, it supports a higher level of in a higher level of integration between the uh, the engineering activities, uh, the purchasing activities and then the, um, the planning and production activities. In terms of AIC, uh, probably a, more of a, a bit more of a tenuous link there that, that uh, certainly the, um, it allows the data to flow to suppliers more accurately and effectively. Um, in terms of the strategic aspects of AIC, um, I don't think it's an immediate uh, driver. Uh, and then in terms of the participation of individual suppliers in Australia, that would be a, a matter of detail in relation to how engineering data is transferred and so forth. Okay, thanks, Levi. Um, Alfred Stolfer asks, he says, you said bigger than the, the Hunter class is bigger than the Hobart class. Did you mean bigger than the Anzac class? Bigger than both. Two and a half times. Two and a half times bigger than the ANZAC class and about 40% bigger than the Hobart class. Right, thanks. Mike Mechanicos says, has Lloyd's Register been engaged to provide certification against their naval ship rules? Yes, they have. Uh, they're contracted by ASC Shipbuilding. I'm pretty sure they're in contract now. Um, but there's a, it'll be a trilateral arrangement between Lloyd's, ASC Shipbuilding and the Commonwealth in terms of uh, addressing um, classification issues. Right, thanks. Um, Trevor Lindars has another question. He says, how have lessons learned on other recent platforms, e.g. the LHDs and the DDGs, influenced the program oversight and collaboration paradigm? Mm. Yeah, so a lot. Uh, many of the people who on the uh, many of the people on the government side on um, Hunter class have LHD experience, and they certainly have bought a range of lessons learned from that program. As have the BAE systems personnel on the other side. Um, the the relationship uh, I think has benefited from LHD in the sense that um, uh, there's been some carryover of uh, people, uh, processes, how how people work together. Um, lots of not saying that um, LHD um, the LHD approach is being reused. It's it's radically different. But 
but there's been that that provided an opportunity for people gain some understanding uh, in terms of the uh, working relationship between the Commonwealth and BAE systems specifically. Um, in terms of AWD, I think uh, that I kind of touched on that answering uh, the previous question uh, on that subject. Um, government definitely took away some quite hard lessons from Hobart class and uh, made high level decisions about how Hunter class is being structured uh, in response to those lessons. Okay, thanks, Levi. Uh, Mahinda Naya asks, what are the redundancies built into the design? Yeah, so I probably won't go into detail on that. I'll just say that there's um, there's a range of uh, survivability characteristics is one of them uh, across a variety of systems. Right. And he also asks, how many days can this vessel stay at sea without coming uh, back to, to base? Oh, great question. And I do not know <laughs> the answer to that off the top of my head. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah, um, it is specified in the Type 26. Um, it is specified in the Type 26 requirements and the um, storing and so forth arrangements um, are um, derived from that. The specific number I couldn't quote you off the top of the head of my head, sorry. Okay. Subham Ashwari asks, do you have any information on the fuel requirements for the RAN systems? I don't know if he means the RAN as a whole or just for the hunter class. Presumably uh, just the hunter. Yeah, it's it's um the RAN will just this ship will use the same um the same fueling arrangements as uh, other RAN platforms, um, MDO or F76, um, just to use the existing um, fuel infrastructure of the RAN. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Scott North, the says, will the modifications of the Type 26 consider the acoustic performance and what is the intended testing to ensure the control of itself noise? Great question and something that we are spending a lot of time thinking about. So there are changes which impact on, there are changes from type 26 to HCF which impact on uh, noise performance and uh, we spend quite a bit of time talking with uh, ASC shipbuilding and BAE systems um, engineers uh, about those changes. Uh, that's probably all I'm going to say about that. Um, and uh, in terms of the tests that are going to be done, um, acoustic performance is assured progressively through the um, design and construction and testing of the ships. So uh, there are acoustic requirements flowed down to equipment, equipment manufacturers and they need to design and develop and build and test their equipment to meet those individual equipment item uh, acoustic requirements. Uh, so that's a supply chain management issue. And then that rolls up through integration of the systems onto the ship. Uh, during the construction of the ship, there's a variety of design rules that have to be uh, respected in, in construction in terms of how you um, fit isolation um, fittings uh, in the piping systems and a whole host of other design and production rules that have to be expected, uh, respected. They are managed through the quality assurance processes. And then uh, once the ship is uh, starting to be activated, there'll be noise tests applied, um, noise tests applied uh, at individual system levels, and then finally at the whole ship level using a variety of ranging approaches. Okay, um, Steve Labor asks, what is the shock class of the Hunter class vessels? Uh, so it's designed to the UK's uh, RN shock standards, um, but I'm not going to get any more specific than that. Okay. Um, Martin Reynoldson, welcome Martin, says, will the five initial blocks be incorporated into ship one? Uh, hi, Martin. Um, pleased to hear from you. And uh, the answer is no, they won't be. Um, that's been kicked around for quite a while. Um, and there's 
um, a variety of other purposes that they've been identified for. In fact, there's a study just being uh, kicked off now uh, that will uh, do the, um, the analysis that's going to eventually inform how those blocks will get dispositioned. But no, it's not expected that they'll be used in ship product. Okay. Uh, to end the thing, uh, so will we be getting these slides? Well, perhaps I can answer that one and saying that the whole presentation uh, is being recorded and will be up on the uh, Engineers Australia website uh, within uh, about five to seven days. Uh, the next one is from Gary Speechley, who says, where is system integration to be conducted? Is it radar, sonar, CMS, comms, IGIS? Yeah, great question um, and a complicated answer, really. Um, so uh, there's, an, there's a land-based test site that's being um, established in Adelaide. Uh, we're currently contracting for that. Um, that test site will uh, provide a lot of the heavy lifting on the uh, integration work. Um, but uh, it's a fair bit more complex than that because various integrations will occur uh, at various points in time and different places. Um, the US Navy and Lockheed Martin US is doing um, a bit of, well, quite a bit of the integration work uh, in the US in terms of the integrations to Aegis. Uh, and then other bits and pieces may have different integration approaches depending on what's needed um, and what facilities uh, are needed to do those integrations. So I can't really give you a clear answer on that. It's, it's, it's a very long answer to that question uh, in essence. So it'll be centered in Adelaide uh, with the LBTS there, but with a distributed effort around the world depending on the distance. Okay, thanks. Uh, Andrew Tewitt says, can you provide a little more detail on what Gibson Cox does for CASG, e.g. design reviews, and also how many engineers does Gibson Cox have working on the C5000 project? Uh, yeah, great question. Um, so, yeah, it, fundamentally our role is supporting the design assurance effort. So uh, design review uh, and deliverable review forms a big part of that. Um, we've been supporting uh, a range of different activities across the program. Um, in terms of number of people, we currently have roughly six and a half positions um, supporting the uh, supporting the C5000 project at the moment. Okay, thanks. Mohammed Uden asks, what is the crew size that will be on the on the Hunter class frigates? Yeah, good question. So I, I think that I think the crew is 180 is the nominated figure, uh, and I think there's a requirement for some additional capacity in terms of uh, accommodation on the ship above that number. Uh, but I think they're targeting the number of 180. Apologies okay. if I got that wrong. That's just that's what I that's the number that I, I believe is the case. Okay, Martin Reynoldson's back, and he says, "What is the sea state for operation of the helicopters?" Ah, oh. <laughs> now you're really testing my requirements knowledge, Martin. Um, <laughs> I don't, I can't remember well enough to quote a figure. I'm sorry. I, 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 no, I wouldn't quite quote. I just, okay, well, I, I can't quote the number in the, uh, in the requirements off the top of my head, sorry. Greg Hellesy asks, how is closure of the mission space achieved? Oh, the mission bay, yeah. So the mission bay has um, two large uh, doors. I'm pretty sure, gosh, I'm pretty sure they're hydraulically actuated. Uh, yeah, two large hinged doors. They're hinged from the top edge of the door, uh, and so they fold up, uh, and then the, um, the uh, davit can operate out over the side. Okay. Um, Carl Oberg asks, are there any new innovations in terms of construction techniques being used in this project? Great question. Uh, in terms of new, nothing, nothing that I'm aware of that's radically new. Like it's, it's, uh, it's fairly standard naval welded steel construction. 
the shipyard is uh, fantastic. It's um, it's completely you know the 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 main portion of the shipyard that we do will be doing the steel construction is completely new. Uh, it's just being finished now. Uh, it does have a range of automation in it. So there's a, a semi-automatic panel line um, and uh, various robotic welding facilities. Um, uh, sorry, robotic welding and, and cutting facilities. Uh, so there's a fairly fairly good level of use of automation in the shipyard, but none of that is particularly um, innovative. It's it's standard uh, shipbuilding practice, modern shipbuilding practice being applied. Okay, um, David Foster asks, what will the class in weapon systems be? Are you going to be using phalanx? Yes, two times phalanx fitted to the ship, uh, as well as um, as well as the two uh, Raphael Bushmaster 30 millimeter cannons. That are uh, not so much of an anti-air function on those, um, but phalanx will be the primary uh, CIWS capability. Okay, thanks. Uh, Dixit Kumar Patel asks, can we get the lecture file? Well, maybe I'll answer that one. The um, same as the previous answer, that the uh, presentation is being recorded and will be up on the Engineers Australia website within a week. Uh, Raymond Wells asks, can you comment about what standards are used for the design? Yeah, uh, so the the... Standards library is as per uh, what was used in designing Type 26. So the, uh, the, the main aspect of the standards library is, uh, is the death stand library. Uh, so in broad terms, the ship is designed to RN's uh, standard suite. Okay, thanks. Uh, somebody, I can't see, oh, Ali. Ali, someone. Uh, in regards to minimum change, would there be a risk of cyber attack? Yes. Um, so cyber is uh, an important issue in the program. Uh, I don't know that it. I don't know that those two concepts are strongly linked. We uh, we are addressing cyber, and the areas that are being changed on the ship are fundamentally the um, the digital systems, the combat management system. Uh, and the um, uh, the sorry, I was just getting a note there. Um, the network systems. So, uh, whilst cyber is an important issue, uh, it's not necessarily impacted by minimum change. Okay, Alan Devlin asks: The hunter class frigate will have both SM2 and ESSM. What are the differences between these two weapons systems? Uh, just size and range, uh, fundamentally. So the ESSM is the smaller missile used of shorter range engagements. I think it's about a 75 kilometer range, something like that. Uh, and then SM2 is a much larger, heavier round with a much longer range. Okay. Martin Reynoldson asks, will the Hunter class use the same propellers as the T-26? As far as I'm aware, yes. Okay. Drew Jardine says, I'm interested in the condition monitoring systems on the Hunter class. What new technologies are being integrated? Um, yeah, so new technologies, uh, depends what you mean by new technologies. Um, it's, a, it's a sophisticated condition and monitoring system. Um, there's uh, an absolute heap of sensor channels uh, into the IPMS in the past 10,000, um, very complex uh, sensor network uh, in the condition monitoring system. It's, um, it's capable of um, uh, real-time communications with shore support arrangements um, to, uh, to provide uh, support services. Uh, it's capable of supporting uh, condition-based monitoring. Um, it's pretty pretty comprehensively uh, net, sorry a, a pretty comprehensive network of sensors uh, across all the platform and combat systems 
Um, so it's a, it seems to be a, a pretty um, robust system. In terms of new technologies, I'm not sure that I would say there's any radically new technologies in it. Okay, thanks. Um, Joshua Nguyen says, how has the program been able to manage stakeholders and control the interfaces between the various systems? Yeah, great question and uh, something that uh, there's a lot of ongoing work on. Uh, the, the combat system is substantially developmental. Uh, the way that the way that uh, that's being dealt with is through the engineering governance framework. So the um, the participants uh, participate in a range of working groups. Uh, they're administered by the head contractor, uh, but the uh, the design arrangements. Um, or the design participation runs across uh, the various participants and major system suppliers to make sure that uh, integration of systems is addressed um, to the satisfaction of each of the participants and drive risks out of the design. Uh, and those working groups roll up to ultimately up to steering groups and a, and a design council at the top. Um, so it's, a, it's quite a well integrated uh, design management arrangement. Um, and I, I observe that working well. Chris Smith asks, will we be sticking with the Rolls-Royce Mission Bay hydraulic handling system or will this be changed to a more capable system? Uh, I don't believe there's any intention to change the system out. I believe we're going with the current equipment fit from Type 26. Okay. Um, Mark Hopkins asks, will Gibson Cox have presence at the shipyard throughout the program? Uh, hope so. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we'll Brett Ellis asks, are any composites used in any components of the vessel structure? Yeah, great question. Uh, so the Type 26 uses a composite mast, and uh, that's for, for Hunter class that's been deleted for a new mast to support the CFAR radar. Uh, the Australian mast is going to be in welded aluminium. Uh, however, there is some consideration of uh, changing some steel fabricates to composite fabricates uh, as a weight reduction measure, um, but they would only be um, relatively smaller parts, like larger door panels and so forth. Okay, well, many thanks, Levi, for the presentation. On behalf of Reiner, IMR, ESG and all of the participants this evening,